All right, hi everybody. Today we're going to be talking about marine ecology. So here we go. First of all, let's talk about uh, what we call population growth. And if we take a species, which we've already talked about this, and I don't know if I've ever really defined these, but I'm going to do that now just in case. But when we're talking about a particular species, that is an individual type of organism, and an organism is any kind of living thing. I've used those words kind of loosely as we move through the semester. So members of the same species of something in general can reproduce and have viable offspring, meaning those offspring can them themselves reproduce. There's some nuances there, but that's a good definition for species for most biology, I would say. And most living things are capable of a tremendous rate of reproduction. So for example, if you look here in this particular case, this organism undergoing exponential growth, starting with, starting with just one or two organisms, could very quickly go from one to two to four to eight, and you can see it just sort of takes off. That's called exponential growth. But what happens is, in reality, populations don't really do that in the wild. Usually they hit some kind of resistance, uh, and we often will call this the carrying capacity. This is the maximum number of individuals that can be supported by the environment. And things happen like you run out of nutrients or space and that sort of thing. And so what happens is, although the population takes off at first, it kind of tapers off as you get near this carrying capacity, often represented by the letter K. And if you think about it, the other problem is not only do you run out of nutrients, uh, but you have things eating you. You have predators. So this is the typical food chain, which you've probably seen something like this before, where you have one organism that eats another organism that eats another organism. And what happens is, if you think about that, that means that not all of these are going to survive and reproduce. So then the next question is, which individuals are going to make it and which ones are not? How are we going to know that? Well, that might be hard to exactly know, but I bet we can come up with a pretty good guess. As you have predators eating certain dinoflagellates and not others, as you run out of nutrients, as you run out of space, certain individuals are going to make it, others aren't. The ones with the best genetics, for whatever reason, whatever those are, are going to be the ones that survive and others don't. And that ends up being a very good example of evolution by natural selection. So over time, this population is changing, even though there's still dinoflagellates, certain genes that are related to how well they get nutrients or survive or reproduce, those are passed on, whereas others don't. And that's how one particular species, one population, changes over time in terms of numbers. What we're going to do next is we're going to look at how they interact. So if you have one population of, say, these dinoflagellates and some plankton-eating organism, some filter feeder, how do those two populations interact? And that gets into community ecology, which is the interactions of different species. We're going to talk about that next. And then our final step will be the much bigger picture, which is even more complex, which is ecosystem ecology, which is community ecology in addition to all the abiotic factors. So when we talk about ecosystems, we're talking about the living organisms, which are the biotic part, and we're also talking about abiotic portions of that ecosystem, such as water and uh, rocks and gases. So all the non-living components that are also related to that, those affect how the system as a whole works. There are basically four different types of interactions that we can sort of categorize any two species in, in terms of how they interact with each other if they do. For example, if we talk about, uh, in the first example, we just talked about this food chain, which is a good example of predator-prey kinds of systems where one organism eats another. And in those scenarios, obviously the organism that gets eaten is losing and the organism that ate, you know, the plankton or the other fish, the one that did the eating, that species is gaining. What we do in a predator parasitism scenario is we put a plus 
by species one, that's the predator in this case, and species two, we put a minus symbol. And what that means is we're talking about energy flow in terms of gaining or losing energy. So we talk about what you're gaining or losing. So if you get eaten, you lose all of your energy and you need to eat things in order to get energy in terms of energy. We also talk about an organism's job or role in an ecosystem. This is called the ecological niche what that organism does. What an organism has basically over time evolved to be able to do in a particular ecosystem in terms of gaining nutrients and is constantly working on that. And so ecologically, it has a particular role or job in that whole ecosystem when we look at it. Parasitism is also there. So let's say you had a, a flea on your dog and the flea is getting energy from your dog. The dog is losing because it's losing energy. The flea is gaining kind of thing. Okay, in commensalism, you have one organism that benefits and the other organism doesn't really gain or lose. It doesn't really matter to the other organism if it's there. So in this example here, uh, we have a whale. There are many whales and there are many kinds of barnacles that only grow on whales and it's believed, at least from what we know, that the barnacle benefits because it, it has a substrate, it has a place to grow. And as far as we know, the whale doesn't care one way or the other. It doesn't affect the life of the whale. The whale seems to still, still do just fine. In mutualism, uh, you have two organisms that interact in such a way that they both benefit. This is a moray eel with a cleaning wrasse fish and the moray eel eats other fish uh, and other things that would eat it, except the cleaning wrasse. And so the cleaning wrasse gets food particles off the moray eel. And in return, the moray eel provides protection because a bigger fish is not going to go over and eat the cleaning wrasse when it's got a moray eel um, as a friend. Clownfish, same kind of thing. The clownfish develop a mutualistic relationship where they do not get stung by the sea anemone. They clean the sea anemone. They eat particles of food. And the sea anemone uh, is, is also protected because it prevents other things. It'll clean anything that's falling on the sea anemone. So it keeps it nice and clean. Uh, the last one is competition. In competition, both organisms are negatively affected because they're competing for some resource and both of them would be better off if the other one wasn't there. Now in this particular one we have two hermit crabs that are fighting over a shell and if there was only one individual there there would be plenty because there's two they're fighting over it. Now in this particular case this is an example of intraspecific competition. When we talk about ecosystems, we talked about the food chain. One of the problems with the food chain is it's often too simplistic. What you see in a food web here is that one organism might feed on a whole bunch of different things. So those then become much more complex because then the population of any one of the prey or say any of those predators could have an effect on each other as they grow or decrease in population size. So it's a much more complex view and it's a much more realistic view of how most ecosystems work. Now over here, just to show you an example, is the African food web over here. The real difference is just the artist's rendition of what they've added to it. So food webs in the ocean are just as exceedingly complex as those on land. But what I do wanna point out is the reason I put a land food web up is, is where they are really different is if you look sort of at the bottom in the terrestrial African food web, you have a whole bunch of plants that are on the bottom. And those are the producers, as you'll see, we call those producers because they're doing the photosynthesis. We talked about this before. And all the big animals eat at that producer level there. Okay, so this is missing, say, elephants, and giraffes and some of the really big mammals, all of which eat plants, okay? Now, in the ocean food web, there are plants, but 
that is not a significant part of the ocean's ecosystem's food web. For the most part, it is these phytoplankton. So it is these very different looking organisms that are still doing photosynthesis for the most part. That's where the base of the food chain is. And what do the really big animals eat, like the whales? Well, they're not eating plants, which they would on land, and they're mostly not even eating um, the phytoplankton directly, but rather they're eating krill, which there are a lot of, but, but it's interesting because it's, it's sort of the next level up from the phytoplankton, which is a very different idea than what you see on land. So one of the things that's interesting about marine biology is that in terrestrial ecosystems, when you talk about ecology in general, it's quite different when you're talking about an ecosystem on land versus one in the ocean. Uh, both of them rely heavily on producers, um, but, but they're not plants. And your big organisms are eating at that next level up often, which is interesting. Okay. Now, speaking of what we call, you know, different energy levels, I mentioned these producers before, and we talked about producers once before when we talked about um, the dinoflagellates and the diatoms and all those different uh, eukarya that are single celled uh, organisms that make up a lot of the producers and the phytoplankton in that category there. And then as you move up, there's, you know, bigger and bigger organisms. Well, organisms that eat producers, we call those first level consumers or primary consumers, and then secondary consumers and tertiary consumers, then all the way up. And so in this particular example, the killer whale or orca is the sixth level consumer. So as you go up, there's all these different levels. And once again, an organism doesn't have to just eat the next one below it. It could eat the next one below it, and then a whole bunch of different ones uh, below that. As you go up, you can form from the biomass of those, the, the number of them, what are called energy pyramids. And what you find in both land and in the ocean is that it forms what we call an energy pyramid, where the base of the pyramid is always bigger than what you have on top. There's always more primary producers, for example, than killer whales. And whether you're on land or in the ocean, that's true. And that has to be true because of what is called the second law of thermodynamics, which briefly is that disorder or entropy is always increasing. Now, what happens here is the definition is hard to sort of like, you know, grasp, but the example will not be. So it's called the second law of thermodynamics, which is that entropy is always increasing in an ecosystem. And again, that part, you know, you can just sort of keep that in your mind for a minute. What happens is that when one organism eats another, it's never getting all the energy out of it. So the mechanics of one organism eating another organism, you are always losing some of the chemical energy stored in there in the form of heat. When you eat a hamburger, for example, and it has 400 calories in it or 500 or whatever, you're never ever getting all that energy into you. You're always, because you have to digest it and break it down, you're always losing a percentage of that in the form of heat. And that is the entropy part. Heat is the most disordered form of energy. And so whenever one organism meets another, you're always losing energy. That will help you, I think, in terms of understanding that much better. There are always going to be more plants or phytoplankton. So in an ecosystem, the odds of you going out and seeing a killer whale are low compared to your odds of going out and seeing brown algae or green algae. Your odds of seeing a plant are always going to be greater than your odds of seeing a mountain lion because that energy transformation, you're always losing some energy in the form of heat. Okay, so we're going to stop there. That's the end of the first part of ecology. I hope everyone's having a good day and I will talk to you all soon.